Hi, I'm Henry Kramer, and I'm here with Tone Bass today to talk about Schubert's Wanderer Fantasy. I first uh, heard this piece, I think, live when I was still an undergrad at Juilliard. And I was so struck in the performance by how I felt as a listener. I was going through all these different spaces, emotional, even I could imagine physical spaces, because the harmonies in this piece are so wild. And I think that combined with the the virtuosity of this piece and the, the tour de force nature of, of everything being demanded by the performer really attracted me to this work and I wanted to, to have that experience on stage with it. Schubert based this piece off of his song Der Wanderer, which uh, he uses the central part of as the second movement, if you will, of this fantasy. I had played other pieces by Schubert that did this, uh, for instance, the Trout Quintet, which has Di Forel, or the Violin Fantasy, which uses Zaimir Gegrust. And I was always so entranced by how he expanded on the meaning of the song through these instrumental works that essentially don't have any text, and what, what he must have been thinking. So I found that this work not only provides plenty of pianistic challenges for me, but also so much to think about in, in terms of how Schubert composed, how he developed his ideas, and, and ultimately how he communicated uh, his aesthetic in, in, in this idea of wandering, this idea of loneliness, um, this idea of being a stranger in this, in this piece, and, and how that manifests in that actual fantasy. Schubert composed this piece in 1822, and he, at the time, it was on the heels of the publication of his, his opus one, the Erlkönig, which really established him as a well-known composer of Lieder. For the purposes of, of getting this piano piece published and, and having it disseminated, he incorporated these well-known Lieder songs into this instrumental work. The Vienna public knew Schubert primarily as a composer of Lieder. Um, they didn't know his instrumental works. In fact, I don't even think he heard his symphonies played in his lifetime. Going on with that idea, uh, he composed the Wanderer Fantasy two months after he had left work on the unfinished symphony. So when I come to a work like this, my my knowing these things really influences how I come to a piece or come to a composer. I think it's very interesting he was grappling with the instrumental form, with the solo piano work, with the symphony. I think it's also really interesting that this is based on a song, that we have a text that we can actually apply to this music, if you will. Furthermore, I look at the title of the piece. It's not simply a, a sonata, it's a fantasy. And what is that? Um, well, it's an instrumental style that goes back to the 16th century. And then C.P.E. Bach's fantasies were wild, full of contrasts. Then we have Beethoven, who composed the two sonatas, like Fantasias, which, like this piece, are in multiple movements that go ataka, that there's no stop. But also, and in this time, people were improvis improvisers. They would take a theme and create these long fantasies for, for the audiences in, in, in the parties, in the halls. Um, and oftentimes, these, this incorporated variations. This incorporated dance movements on the theme. And also, more contrapuntal finales that maybe even 
were like feuds. And I think this is the model, this kind of romantic virtuoso fantasy that Schubert is going on. But I also think the title has a lot to do with the text. You know, what is a fantasy? It's, it's somebody dreaming about something. And in the text, Der Wander, it's, it's about this person who feels everywhere he is, he's cold, he's alone, he has, his friends are not there. He's dreaming of the land where his friends are, but he feels everywhere he's a stranger. So I take all these elements and this informs how I, how I would start working on this piece. One of the essential elements of this work which has been written about and discussed is the idea of thematic transformation. Um, and when people talk about that, they are obviously referring to what is called a dactylic rhythm, this which starts the piece and eventually from the song, this music. The same rhythm at Adagio instead of Allegro con fuoco. Now, this rhythm is, appears a lot in music at this time. Um, the long, short, short, long, short, short, long. A few examples. Obviously, there's Beethoven's symphony, uh, this, the seventh symphony, the second movement. is full of this rhythm. In Schubert, we have it in the Death and the Maiden string quartet. These are very obvious examples. But I think uh, to get at the character of this piece, another, another music we have to think about, which came later, is his song cycle, Die Winterreise, which connects with the theme of Der Wander, the idea of wandering, of, of being alone, of, of not having a home, of, of being subjected to the world and feeling as if you are at odds with it. And there's a beautiful song um, that happens late in the, in the course of, of Die Winterreise, and it's called Das Wirtshaus, which is is the, the tavern. Um, and it's about a man who wearily approaches a graveyard and, and he creates the analogy of this graveyard as a tavern or an inn. And he says, are there any rooms for me to stay in? Um, and he's, he's very tired and it's a beautiful, beautiful song and I think really connects to the music of this piece. So on. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. And I also found um, this Wanderer's Nachtlieder, Wanderer's Night Song, another leader, um, which uses this rhythm, this. So this is all to say that when we approach Schubert, you have to look. You have to look at the full composer. What? Where does he use this rhythm? Why? What does it mean to really help us understand the character of these movements? Now, I mentioned earlier that um, we have also the unfinished symphony being composed at this time, and I think there are, are definitely certain connections with this music too that we need to keep in our ear. One is the is. Schubert's use of tremolo in, in orchestral music, which 
when you think about Beethoven, we don't really have many examples of this, but in Schubert, it's everywhere. So if you take in, in the second movement of the Wanderer, the compare it, say, to a passage in, um, in the, the symphony, in the development, it starts... Uh... have this in our ear because this this is a uh, one of the the things that Schubert must have been thinking in composing this piece or if you take much later piece the beautiful G major quartet full of tremolando This is something that Liszt would, would take and use all over the place in his work. And the Wanderer Fantasy had a huge influence on Liszt. He even composed a version of it for piano and orchestra, maybe even further uh, expounding on the idea of the, the solo person in this work. So I want to talk about a few moments in the song, because I think this gives us an idea of what is happening in the piece. So the song begins in a key that is unrelated to where it ends up and to the key signature. It's in a key signature with four sharps, so either E major or C sharp minor, but starts with this C sharp major harmony. uncertain half cadence on C sharp major. I think that's the first point we need to think about when we encounter C sharp major or its enharmonic related key, D flat major, in the wonder of fantasy. These moments are not necessarily real. They're searching moments. They're not, it's not the home key. The next key I want to talk about is E major. So this is where, in the poem, the, the poet, or the, the speaker, and by the way, this poem was written by uh, Philip Georg Schmidt. Uh, he says, I wander silently and am somewhat unhappy, and my sighs always ask where. We'll get back to that point about where. But this beautiful melody happens in E major. So, will return again in the poem when the narrator says, where are you? Where are you, my, de my dear land, my friends, the land that is green? We have... It's beautiful. So, and then the, the whole song ends in E major, which 
If we started here, you know, it's it, and then here. That's a tertian relationship. Or even if the poem is in C sharp minor, and then to E major. And these relationships are all over the, the wonder of fantasy itself. So in my mind, I think of E major as a kind of the key of this, this land, the imagined place that he wishes he were, but where he is not. So it's, it's opposite. C sharp minor, the relative minor, where we change one note, the fifth, we get C sharp minor, right? This is where we get the, the, the core of, of the Wander of Fantasy, the C sharp minor. I obviously am not a singer, but the narrator is saying, the sun seems so cold to me here. The flowers faded, the life old, and what, what they say has an empty sound. Ich bin ein Fremdling, stranger, überall, means I, I'm a stranger everywhere. Um, so whenever we have C sharp minor, this ha we have to imagine the, the text, this, the sun seems so cold to me here, the flower is dead. You know, it's, it's the most um, tragic place in, in, the, in the course of this piece. So when we have these harmonies, we have to always look at where they appear in the course of the work and, and what do they mean. Finally, I want to get to the point of the, this text which I, I talked about where he says, and my sighs always ask where. Ime vo. And on this word ime, we have this chord, which is something between um, a French augmented six and a German augmented six. And this chord is going to become the, it's everywhere in the piano fantasy. I think of it as, is the questioning chord or, or the chord where the narrator is struggling to find a destination, right? So even in the opening of this piece, you hear that chord? Already we have a augmented six chord. Yeah? What's that? That's a minor chord. It's, it's being treated as an impoggiatura, but we already have this instability of major and minor, which is going to be all throughout the piece, especially in the second movement and the variations where we're constantly going between C-sharp minor and C-sharp major. It's this very weird space where you're not, you're sad, you're happy. Which one is sad? Which one is happy? Is it sadder in C-sharp minor or C-sharp major? So all of these things we learn about the piece is, is from the poem. My final, final thing I want to say is that the last line of the poem, he says, I wander silently and somewhat unhappy, and my sighs always ask, where? In a ghostly breath, it calls back to me, there where you are not, there is your happiness. And I'll just play a little bit of where, what happens musically.
ends in E major. Where you are not, that's where happiness is. So I think we can take a lot from looking at the harmonies of this song and then apply it to the fantasy. You know, ultimately, we want the work to sound like we are declaring something to the audience. It shouldn't sound like four movements. It should sound like a, a fantasy, literally like about this text. So in order to do that, we have to first start with the song. What does the song mean? And I want to point out one more detail here, which is that idea of thematic transformation. I don't think it's really just about the dactylic rhythm, da, 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 being slowed down or sped up or changed into a waltz. I think there's this idea of a rising four note chromatic scale or rising scale that is the key to this, the, the, the development of this music. If you look at the beginning of the, the song, you have all these different permutations of a rising scale, and this is probably the, the initial departure point for Schubert, where the beginning is. Right? Or you have. Um, So within that four note idea, you have what generates a lot of these harmonies. The augmented sixth chord, the major minor instability. So whenever I come to a piece that I know is related to other music, I want to understand those pieces. I want to feel like I'm the composer when I'm playing. Like I understand how the intricacies of these things work. And of course, that was going to be a lifelong process for me. I don't ever claim that I know what Schubert wanted or intended, but I think that this understanding certain music can, can help us a lot. So in this first movement, I think we should just talk about and identify certain key moments. Obviously, we start in C major. <laughs> 